Would you bow your head and pray with me, church? Father, we bow our heads before you, humbly, recognizing that, that you, you are, are God, God we, are we are not. Our experience in this world is sometimes littered with suffering and pain, difficulty, trials of various kinds. And yet, when we look to you in the scriptures, we see a God who overcomes every obstacle, a God who calls us to endure patiently, even in the midst of trials, because of what you can produce out of it. And so, God, for your great purposes and your divine wisdom and according to your own counsel, you uh, ordained this moment that we just read about in the text, a moment in which you would bring incredible good out of heartfelt suffering. I pray, God, that for those in this room now who are suffering, that they would draw a word of encouragement today from your text, knowing that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that every trial, every, every bit of suffering in this world is temporary. It's momentary. It's light compared to the weight of glory that is to be revealed in Jesus Christ and His second coming. So, Father, I pray to that end that you would use this time together this morning to challenge us, to change us, to help us see you more fully, and that our hope in you would be steadfast and enduring to the end. It's in Christ's name that we pray. It's in His name we gather. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Water's Edge Church. How are we doing today? Everybody doing all right this morning? It's always a blessing. I'm always a joy, always a privilege to be in this house, man, because this church sings and I love it. I love worshiping with this particular body of believers. Um, man, I've been in churches where uh, the people up on stage are the only ones singing. Um, and I just thank you so much that worship for us is not a performance. That worship for us is participatory. And that everybody here um, that is gathered is a part of our worship. Because worship is not about anybody that's on stage. It's not about even you for that matter. Worship is about the one true God who we're who we are giving honor to, who we're giving praise to. And so this morning, man, thank you for that. That just, it warms my heart. And, and it really, it's because I'm an athlete. I always think of like pregame. So it really gets me pumped up to preach, to be honest with you. I get really excited when we start worshiping and singing to the Lord and, and just kind of prepare my own mind and heart to, to share what, you know, what the Lord has been pressing on me all week long as I've sat under um, you know, the Spirit and His teaching. Uh, wrestling with this text. The story of Lazarus is so lengthy in the book of John, and I think such a central component of the book of John that we decided to, to take three weeks to walk through it. So if you weren't here last week, uh, we read the first part of this story. And in the first part of this story, Jesus gets word that his friend Lazarus is ill. And Jesus makes the deliberate choice not to immediately go to him. And he very specifically waits, and then he tells his friends, okay, his disciples, Lazarus is dead now. Let's go to Judea. And that was, that was met with a little bit of hesitation on his disciples' part. Because in the last chapter, we, we learned as we walked through John that the last time they were in Judea, things didn't go so well for them, right? I mean, Jesus did a lot of really cool things. He healed a blind man. Um, but that stirred up all kinds of controversy. And so much so, in fact, as he was being questioned, his responses to the questions that were presented to him infuriated the people who were gathered so much so that they picked up stones and they were ready to kill him. They were ready to take his life. And so his disciples, remembering all of that, they're like, wait, wait a second, Jesus. I'm not so sure we should be in such a hurry to go back there, if you know what I mean, right? And then that text concludes with uh, Thomas, you know, the one who gets the, the reputation of being the doubting Thomas turning to his fellow disciples. And man, and I don't know if this was sarcasm, or I don't know if this was a hopeless plea, but he was like, hey guys, let's go die with him also. <laughs> Assuming that one, uh, that Lazarus is dead, and two, that Jesus is going to be killed when they go back there. And by association, they likely would be putting themselves in danger. And so that's kind of how that text left off last week. But Jesus had deliberately waited, and, and the timing is important. Because by the time this text picks up in verse 17, where we begin today, we see that it had been four days 
had gone by. It says when he came, he found out that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So in hope of, of, of Lazarus just being in a coma or, or just kind of waking up and, and it not being death, but just maybe uh, he, he, uh, asleep or in a coma or knocked out or unconscious or whatever, all of that's gone at this point. Four days have passed and it was real to them and it had sunk in to Lazarus' loved ones and the Jews that had gathered there um, that this was an event and it was a time for mourning. And so Jesus, in verse 17, it says, He comes, finds out Lazarus has been in there for four days. They go to Bethany. It says in verse 18, which was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, so just outside of Jerusalem. Verse 19 says, Many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brothers. So that, that is indication. It indicates that these people were, were pretty influential. That they, they, they weren't just um, peasants, so to speak, but, but rather Mary and Martha and Lazarus had some some sway in the community. Um, so some of the influential people, some of the Jews come there to help them, to, to console them in their uh, grief. But what I want to do today is, is not what, what's typical for us as we expositionally walk through this text. Usually we kind of go verse by verse. Today I want to, I want to move around within this text um, because the first thing I want to do is show the various reactions to Jesus when he gets there. Because I think it's instructive for us when we think about when we've went through something in our lives, how do we respond to God in those moments? And so you see a, a variety of reactions, three to be exact, in this text that I want to take time to kind of poke around and look at and examine and, and do so in light of um, making application for us today. Okay. And so the first reactions that we see, um, I'm going to point out Mary and Martha's reaction. We see this, Mary and Martha, uh, Mary, or Martha is the first one to come to Jesus in verse 21, and she says this to him when he arrives, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then we see in verse 32, Mary, who later comes, saying the exact same thing, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, where were you? And I don't know like the tone of this. It seems like there's a, there's an element of, of faith going on here. Like you could have you could have done it, Jesus. We know we trust in you that you have the power that you could have helped them out. But then there also right could be this element of frustration. Like where were you? We sent for you days ago. You you could have, have have been here. Why did you delay in your coming? You know, and I look at, at their words, and it's interesting to see how these. Women particularly respond to him. Mary and Martha react to Jesus with the same initial words, but each according to their own unique personality. Merrill Tenney, Bible scholar, says, Martha, being more aggressive, went out to meet Jesus. As soon as she heard that he was coming, she went out to him. She, she pursued him. She initiated the contact. Mary was quiet and contemplative and stayed at home, we read. Now, this portrayal of Mary and Martha, of these sisters, agrees with what we know about them from Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. When most of us hear about Mary and Martha, that's the story. If you've been around in church for a little while, that's the story that you're very familiar with. That there was a time where Jesus was visiting and he was in their home. And Martha was, remember she was stirring about, trying to get everything prepared. And Mary was just quietly sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him, oh, teach me, Master. And and Jesus commends her. He says that she's chosen the greater portion. That Martha, you were, you were so busy with life, so busy trying to make everything perfect, that you missed out on this opportunity to just spend this time with me and to really learn from, from me. And so that's why we, we kind of look at that. And this is a classic women's ministry text, right? Being a, a Mary and a Martha world, like this world always has us busy and stirring and, and doing and doing and all of that. And, and yet, Mary's commended there for, for slowing down and taking time to, to think and reflect and to listen to Jesus, to sit at His feet. And so that Mary and Martha is the same Mary and Martha that we're talking about here. And we see in their reactions the same sort of personality. Martha goes out to meet Jesus and Mary sits back quietly. And it's not until Martha comes back and tells her, Jesus is calling for you, that she hurries along to have a conversation with Him. Charles Spurgeon says, her thought was just the same as the thought of Martha, talking about Mary. 
But she did not say as much as Martha did. She never did. When you look at this text, you see that Martha had a dialogue with the Savior, but Mary instead simply fell at his feet. J.C. Ryle says, we see in this interaction a strange mixture of grace and weakness, humanness found in the hearts of true believers. Ryle saw in both Mary and Martha's reaction genuine faith mixed with some element of unbelief or frustration. He goes on to say, rarely indeed in this life do we find the saint who does not often need that prayer, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. So that's what I see in their words. Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Lord, if you had had been here, I believe you could have made a difference. I believe we wouldn't be experiencing this heartache right now. If you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. So there's an element of faith in there, but there's also this mixture of of human weakness and frustration and and a a little bit of of doubt, maybe unbelief. Maybe even if if we take those emotions and we leave them unchecked, what happens? We can find ourselves being bitter with God for the things that happen to us in this world. And a lot of people take that approach. And that's why I think it's important to look at all the reactions we see in this text. Because some people could look at this, you know, I'm doing the right thing. I'm living right. I'm going to church. I'm, I'm following you, Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in Bible study. I'm praying regularly. I'm, I'm doing the right things. And yet this still happens to me. Where were you? And, and I think that anytime we go through suffering and trial, one of the fleshly responses, if we're being honest, is, is to wonder, where, where is God? Why? Why does this happen? Where were you when this happened, God? And, and I think every one of us, if we, if, think about it. Look at, think about your own life and the various things that you've went through. Look at your darkest times in life. Have you asked that question? God, where were you? That's one of the fleshly, I think, responses that we can give. But there's also, we see in their words, truly an element of, of, of faith pushing them towards because they believed in Jesus. These weren't, these weren't women who were perpetual doubters or um, unbelievers. They, they believed in Him. They loved Him. They knew that He could have done something if He were, was there. But they asked the question, where were you? In a sense, asking the question, why? Why did you let this happen? And I think that's one of the other reactions we see in the last verse. Look at verse 37. And that's the second reaction I want to put before us. Why would you let this happen? Look at what they say in verse 37. Some of the Jews, it says, said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? It's a good question. This is, this is Jesus who just about got stoned in that region for opening the eyes of a blind man and then claiming that he was God. And so these guys naturally respond with this question. If he could open the eyes of a blind man, could he not have prevented this man from dying? So what's behind that? What's underneath this response is the question that I want to put before us today. And their reaction, what's, under, what's underlying? So I think they began to question in, these, in this moment either his love or his power, his ability to actually have done something in this moment. This is the age-old dilemma that Christians continually find ourselves discussing with if you, if you venture outside of a Christian bubble and talk with people in the world who have serious objections to the existence of God. This is, this is kind of the cookie-cutter case presentation against God, which presents itself in such a way as this, why would a loving God allow these things to happen if He were able to stop it? Because He did not stop it, either He is A, not loving, as the other people were claiming, that's the third reaction we're going to look at. So either He was not loving because He didn't stop it, or B, He wasn't all-powerful and had the ability to stop it. So the conclusion is that if He is all-loving and that He is all-powerful, He would have not allowed them to go through this. So that's such a simplistic view 
of a very complex, big God. As a matter of fact, I think that Jesus addresses this sort of question when he's presented some information in Luke chapter 13 about kind of this age-old question of why do bad things happen to good people? Have you wrestled with that? I mean, for some for some people like this is if you if you've been around for a while, some of you guys are fine with this stuff. But this is these are legitimate hangups that people have. Why does a good, loving God allow the bad things to happen that happen in this world? And if you care about people, I think this is a question that's worth taking time to attend to, to wrestle through, to kind of deal with in your own heart, so that you'll be able to help and, and talk to others. Well, there was an occasion in Luke 13. When Jesus was essentially asked this thing, he was told about some Galileans who were slaughtered at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And it says in Luke 13, verse 1, there were some present at that very time who told him, that that being Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And so apparently, Pontius Pilate had had several Galileans massacred, killed, slaughtered, and with their blood or with their bodies, mingled that into some pagan religious practice. And so they're asking Jesus, do you know about this? Like, what do you, what do you think about this? And Jesus' response is perplexing. And he says this in verse 2. This is Luke 13. He answered them, do you not think that these Galileans, do you think, he says, that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? It's a rhetorical question. He's saying, do you think that, that, that God was judging them, that there was, there was something worse about their life because they had such an end to it in this world? Or do you think yourselves better than them because you didn't suffer in that way? That's his question. It's a rhetorical question. He answers it himself in the next verse. He says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's an interesting response, to say the least. He goes on to bring up another case. Jesus himself does in verse 4 of Luke 13. He says, Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the other leaders or all the others who lived in Jerusalem? So Jesus says, yeah, I, I know about this massacre. I know, I know what Pilate did. Do, do, you, do you think you're better than because of it? Or that they were, there's other people who were worse than them? Or, or what do you think? And then he says, well, what about these other 18 people who this tower fell on and and killed all of them? Were they somehow worse than all the other inhabitants of Jerusalem? Do you think they were worse offenders, he says? Verse 5, again, he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. what, What am I getting at here? I believe that Jesus wanted to get the idea of a proportionate connection between sin and suffering out of the disciples' minds. Don't don't connect your suffering with with sin. That there's reasons for your suffering that go beyond just punitive penalizing from God or judgment from God. That there's, there's greater purposes that God would allow you to suffer. So He's trying to make that disconnection. And in His day, it was such a common connection. You saw it in, the last, in chapter 9 with the blind man, right? Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And He said... Neither one of them. Why, why do you think that? And, and so here, he, he, he's taking you know, this opportunity to teach them that this, this disproportionate understanding that connecting sin with suffering automa- is an automatic connection. And he's saying no. He doesn't want them, his disciples, to think that they were better people in God's sight because they had not suffered and died in the ways that others had. So he warned them, unless you repent you will all likewise perish. Those who were killed by the Roman troops and those who died when the tower fell may have been upstanding citizens, good people. But in the vertical dimension, in their relationship with God, none of them was innocent. This is the point that Jesus is making. The same is true for us. Jesus was saying, instead of asking this question, why does a good God allow this catastrophe? Why does a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? 
you should be asking, why does a good God allow us to live? A gra- because of His grace. Now, every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. It is only by His grace that we have breath in our lungs and that we have air to breathe. There is reason for us to praise Him and thank Him every single day because we have not suffered such a fate for our rebellion against Him. That everyone is guilty before Him. Jesus was reminding His hearers that there is ultimately no such thing as an innocent person. Thus we should be amazed by God's grace. We should be asking why towers do not fall on us each and every day. His ultimate answer to the why question, why would you let this happen, you know, is, is he doesn't defend himself in saying, in giving his reasons in this moment. He'd already given them in the previous section. Verse 4, he says, it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That's why this happened. And then in verse 15, for your sake, he says to his disciples, I'm glad that I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. In other words, I've intentionally allowed this to happen in order to work something that will etch in your mind forever. And, and you're going to remember this. And, and Dave pointed this out. I mean, we had a great discussion in our small group on Friday night in our community group that there are things that God allows us to go through, even deep pain and suffering, in which He shows Himself faithful and powerful that leave indelible marks on our mind that will forever remember that moment. And so think about the disciples who were given a great task to go and spread the gospel, which was um, hostile to the world. It was offensive to the Greeks and to the Jews. It was a stumbling block. And yet they were to spread this in the known world at the risk of their lives. And so every time their life would be threatened, every moment of danger that would, would be presented to them, they could recall on this moment of what was about to take place, that Jesus was not going to leave Lazarus in the grave, that he did have the power to raise him back to life. And he demonstrates that next week when we get to that part. That's why he let this happen. And we don't always see that, and I think that's why we struggle in this life, right? You know, we, we, we look at things, and we can't possibly imagine how God could work good out of some of the bad things that have happened to us in this life. And that many of us would, would find ourselves in despair or hopeless, discouraged by circumstances. Why would God let this happen? Was He not able? Did He not love them or was He not able? He opened the eyes of the line. Could He not have prevented this man from dying? Yes, He could have prevented Lazarus from dying. But in His great wisdom and according to His good purposes, He allowed them to suffer. And we have to have room in our little theological minds to embrace a God that is big enough to allow you to go through circumstances in which you would question Him. Let me say that again. We have to have in our little theological minds room in the capacity to to embrace a God who is bigger than that. Who would allow us to go through suffering and experience hardship for His good purposes, which He will work out ultimately for our good. That God turns our pain into promise. That, that God doesn't waste our pain. That he gro- there's, there's things that He produces out of bad circumstances. And that's what we learn from this story. The third reaction that we see is in verse 36. Some of the Jews looked upon this situation and they say, See how he loved them. And they did that in response to verse 35. It says, Jesus wept. And and that's not like shed a little tear silently. Like that word means he was was crying. He was wailing. He He was really weeping with Mary. He saw her hurt. He saw her pain. He saw the brokenness. Her 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 putting herself before his feet in grief. And he wept. He he felt in that moment her pain and Martha's pain, Lazarus, these people that he cared for, and he wept. And some of the Jews looked, and their reaction was, see how he loved them. They weren't concerning themselves with the theological questions of why did God let this happen? Where were you, God? They were simply looking for the comforting presence in that time of grief. 
And for many of us who have lost someone that we love, many of us who have who've endured great loss, deep hurt, we know that the ultimate satisfaction, the way we get through those times is not having a theological debate about where was God or why did He let this happen. That what gets us through those moments is the peace of God that transcends our circumstances and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding because it makes no sense in this world. It's a peace that only God can give. It's, it's the peace of His presence. This is why Jesus could say things like He does in Matthew 5. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Amen. So that's the third reaction. That's, that's the goal. When we, as we experience hardship, as we experience suffering, our goal should be to react in this way. Comfort us, God, with your presence. In other words, if it's your will, and it clearly is your will that I go through this, then comfort us in your presence. Don't forsake us. Don't, don't leave us in this moment of need. Show us your power. Be with us. Now, what I want to do now is I want to kind of turn in this text and really focus the remainder of our time on Jesus' conversation with Martha. Because I think he says some things that are incredibly powerful, incredibly instructive for us as we want to better understand and and, um, embrace the good news about Jesus. And that's for this second part. Jesus' conversation with Martha goes like this, starting in verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, look at, here, look at the faith in her words in, in verse 22. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. You know, and, and of course, she, she wasn't really making the connection that he was about to do it. She was thinking, yeah, well, in the future, I know I'll see him again. Kind of how we comfort one another in, in, in those moments. She says back to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus says to her these words, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, and this is it, though he die, yet shall he live. Though he die, yet shall live. He lived. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So Jesus makes this point of connection with belief in Him, death, and life. And it goes like this. In this world, we experience a death. For those who follow Jesus, those who are genuine believers in Christ, I'm talking about Christians in its pure sense here, not in a cultural understanding of what it means to be a Christian. I'm talking about a biblical understanding of Christianity that someone who God has saved is someone who follows Jesus and has died to themselves. And Jesus says that if anyone wishes to follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and come after me. In other words, he must die a death to himself in this life. It's not a physical death. It is a spiritual death. That your life ambition, your goals, your dreams, this life you've created for yourself apart from Christ is the life that He's asking you to lay down. And when you lay that down, when you deny yourself and you follow Him, He says, then and only then will you understand what life really is about. Because then you'll be able to discern your created purpose for whoever loses his life, He says. Whoever dies to themselves, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You're going to find life. You're going to find what, why you were made, why it all makes sense, why God created you. And that's how you find life, by dying first. Even though he die, yet shall he live. But he also means this, I believe, in the physical sense. That, that even though Lazarus has dead, that he's died, that he's dead right now, he's been there for four days, yet he shall live. That Jesus is pointing to the resurrection of the dead, that he will bring his people to life everlasting life with Him for all eternity. And that's the great hope that we have in Him. That's, that's the good news of the Gospel, that even sinners like us get to enjoy that because of God's great mercy. Amen. Now think about it. He, he, he's telling them, even though they die, He shall live. And then He says this, that everyone who lives and believes in Me shall, shall never die. Who is He talking about there? 
Who's never going to die? Well, one, in the eternal sense, all the believers, but two, in the sense that He will come again. And there will be a people prepared for Him on this earth as His bride who won't experience physical death in the way that we may if He continues to wait. And that's exactly, everything He says right here is what we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want to read to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Because Paul, the apostle, writes these words to comfort a people who are struggling with the reality that many of their brothers and sisters in Christ are dying. And they're wondering, where is Jesus? Why hasn't He come back yet? And listen to what Paul says, and, and draw this parallel, draw this connection. He says in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, meaning those who have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Though he die, yet shall he live. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always, always be with the Lord. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And he says in verse 18, Therefore encourage one another with these words. We should draw encouragement from this. We should draw great encouragement from the promise that we have in Christ of life with Him eternal. In a place where there's no suffering, a place where there's no sorrow, that all of our momentary afflictions, all of the death, all of the sorrow, all of the tears, everything that we experience and hardship in this life is temporary for those who have placed their faith in Christ, that there is life beyond this, this, this world. And He continues to remind them, and he's telling that. This is how he comforts, encourages Martha. And and she still didn't know at this point that he was actually about to make it happen. I'm going to show her. And I believe the story of Lazarus for us is is a microcosm of the resurrection on the last day, that Jesus does this. He didn't raise Lazarus. Next week we'll see it. Not to ultimate eternal life in that moment, that he would die again. But his resurrection of Lazarus, of Lazarus demonstrates his power in the face of his disciples and Lazarus' loved ones and some of the Jews that were present so that they would remember. And that it would be this indelible mark on their minds of the power of God to resurrect the dead, which would produce in them great courage and hope, boldness as they embrace the mission of Jesus to spread the gospel to all peoples, every tribe, tongue, and nation. Lastly, point number three, he, he, after saying this to Martha, he just poses this simple question, which I in turn want to, to pose to you today. Verse 26, do you believe this? So after, after saying that to, to Martha, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life, everyone who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Everyone who believes in me and lives shall, shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? So the question is to you, and it's, it's in your court. If I, if, I, if I put that question before you, do you actually believe this? And if so, man, how are you living in light of the implications of this? And this was the, this was the thing for me, and, and just a real moment of honesty, this was the thing for me that I struggled with the most when I was a non-believer, is how could Christians actually believe this and still not go, Radical for Jesus. It, it, for me, it was it was one of those perplexing things because most of the Christians that I knew, people who went to church when I was in high school and in college, they didn't live any different from me. They were, they didn't provide a, a powerful witness to me of Jesus' life, death, death, and resurrection, and how it could change a person's life. So for me, I'm like, man, there's there must not be anything to it because if this were true, like if you really actually believed this, you would be different, right? The way you think about death, the way you think about this life and your time on this earth, 
that, that if you really believe in eternity in the way that Jesus presents it to us, why would we not give our lives for the sake of the gospel? Why would we not live in such a way where, where we don't fear death? Yeah, we grieve. Yes, we hurt. Yes, we sorrow. We, we weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. But why would we not live markedly different from the world in light of this belief that Jesus has overcome the grave and that He has power to resurrect us to life? Why do we fear man? Why do we care about what other people's opinions are? Why do we shrink in the face of potential persecution or intellectual ostracization or, or whatever it is that would keep us from actually embracing the gospel and sharing it with our brothers and sisters and, and our loved ones who don't know Him? People, our neighbors. Like, Why would we keep this news to ourselves? Do you believe this? So do you have hope? I mean, do you really believe that when you die, that you will once be raised to life in Christ, that He will resurrect you from the dead and that you will live eternally with Him in a place, again, where there's no sorrow. It doesn't have the effects of sin that this world has on it. Do you believe, church? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank You for for Your Word. I, I, I love how it has the ability to, to kind of hit on these pressure points for us. And, you know, at the heart of our human fragility and weakness, in our frustration, sometimes we can wonder, maybe even presume to know better than you, God, how this world should be governed. And that if you were all loving and all powerful, maybe you, you wouldn't have created a world this way. And I think that that's just such a small-minded approach philosophically to wrestling with the problem of evil and suffering in this world. And God, you're way bigger than that. That for your own reasons and for your own purposes, you designed this world perfectly in a way that would bring a maximum glory to who you are. Your mercy, your grace, your love, your holiness, your justice. You are God and you, your ways are higher than our ways. That our thoughts are not your thoughts, God. And yet you intimately are involved and care about each and every one of us. And I think about Jesus' words to Martha on that day. Do you believe this? And I pray, God, that you would produce the kind of faith in us that would we could confidently affirm, yes, I believe. And I pray, God, that uh, for, for anybody in this room that's still kind of wrestling, that I pray that you would um, work in their hearts, help them um, to, to pursue you, truth. I, I pray that their pursuit would not stop, um, that they would be able to ask honest questions and to be able to, to wrestle through whatever doubts they have. For the believer in this room, I pray that there would be a greater confidence that there would be a, a greater perspective whenever trial or suffering presents itself to us, that we would recognize it as temporary, knowing that you've overcome and that we will be overcomers. So God, help us. Help us to respond appropriately today to your word. Um, whichever way you see fit, if it was a, a time for us as a body to be strengthened and edified, May it be. If it was a time where an individual in this room may at least begin to ask the, the right questions in pursuit of you, may it be. If it was a time in which someone in this room is going through something and needs to be encouraged by your power and your wisdom, God, to even allow them to be in the situation that they're in, may they not doubt you. May they place their trust in you, knowing that you work out everything for the good of those that love you. Help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.